we haven't seen the likes of, perhaps, since the Civil War. And I absolutely will not go political in the pulpit. But we need to pray for this nation, no matter who is our president, following this weekend or following the inauguration, no matter who are our senators and congressmen and women, no matter who, and I could go on, they need the guidance of the Lord. We need to come together as a nation and the need is just so clear and so obvious. And I believe clearly the Lord answers the effective, fervent prayers of righteous people. So I challenge you, the rest of this day, perhaps even to fast, take some time and instead of a meal, go before the Lord. Take him at his word. For he has said, if my people, Humble themselves and call on me. I will hear their prayer and I will heal their land. And this is the cry and need for today. So after a moment of silence, I will lead us in the people's prayer. Lord God, you are an awesome God. You have spoken and the worlds appeared and created human beings in your own image. You gave us the church. You created human government. You have told us in your word to be subject to the powers that you have ordained. And many times, Lord, honestly, we do not understand your sovereignty as it works out in the forms of government in this land and throughout the world. But we believe you, we believe your word, we trust you, and we come before you in all the humility that we possibly can. And we pray for our president, our vice president, for all of the men and women from the highest levels to the local councils Oh, God, may people turn to you, look to you for guidance, look to you for wisdom, stand for what is right and true and holy and just. You have told us to do this in your word, and we lift these people to you. And Lord, as an individual and as a congregation, I commit to keep in prayer, especially in the next several hours for our nation. We also know that you're the God who cares about families who hurt. And so we lift the family of the one mentioned to you. Only you can come along beside them, Spirit of God, and give them peace and comfort. May they know that people are praying for them and for others who are ill, who are in need of healing. We lift them to you. We rejoice in our pastor and his wife's child being birthed and well, and we just give you great thanks and praise over that. Then, Lord, we would pray against the evil in this world. We would pray against the virus. We rebuke all of that in Jesus' name, for there is power in that name. And greater are you, Spirit of God, who is in us and among us, than he who is in the world. And we claim that power. And we sing your greatness. We sing your sovereignty, your grace, your love, your mercy. For we know that is what our world needs today. And so may the gospel, the truth, go out from every congregation in this world today that honors you. But not only that, may it go forth from the individuals as we leave this place and as we go about the tasks and the duties that you have given to us. So thank you for this wonderful privilege of prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching your disciples. And we pray as you taught them to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would direct you to a scripture. <clears throat> it's listed there in your bulletin. And I want to make one addition, but the first scripture is the second chapter, almost all of it, of the book of Genesis. So I invite you to turn there, and I thank you for this wonderful pulpit Bible here, one that has the print, the size that people like me need. This is the Word of God, beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, and the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river Watering the garden flowed from Eden, and there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon, that winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second is the Gihon, that winds through the entire land of Put. The name of the third river is the Tigris, it runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. <clears throat> the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And the Lord God said, it is not good a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And now the Lord God had, had, had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made the woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of a man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. And then I'd like to turn to Revelation chapter 21. And read the first five verses. Revelation, the very last book in your Bible. Chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, 
beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And there ends the reading of God's word. And Cooper, you can open up that bag and go into the goodies in there now. I'd like to raise a question with you in the message. You've already seen the question there in the bulletin. What does God want? That question can be asked in a couple of ways. I'm in a men's group, and uh, we we're reading through and studying the book of Job, and it seems like there's a little sarcasm in Job, almost saying, what does God want? And I think if I had been in Job's situation, I might have felt the same consternation over what does God want? But this is just a straight question. What does God want? What did he have in mind in the first place? So we just read there from the very beginning to the very ending. And incidentally, this is not part of the sermon, but if you read that second chapter of Genesis fairly casually, you may get the idea that it contradicts the first chapter of Genesis. For in the first chapter of Genesis, it says that God created the earth, the rocks, the plants, the trees, and man as the very last thing. And we believe clearly that is the order. If you do not read carefully and realize a past present tense, remember your old English teacher? who told you that there are two pasts. So when I came home this morning, no, when I drove up to church this morning, I was informed that there was a window left out and open in my car, so I went out and closed it. So you see, we have a past and then a past past. We call that the past perfect. But if you read that second chapter carefully, you will see that it says, when God had already created. He had already created. There's no contradiction in the word of God. Sometimes we have some difficulty understanding some of the things because it's a translated book. But the word of God is very clear. There's no contradiction. Now, I like to begin with a little lightheartedness every once in a while. We talked about where man and woman came from. And there was a little girl who came to her mother and said, Mom, where did I come from? Well, you came from me. Is that all? Well, Dad, too, but, well, where did you come from? Well, I came from my mom and and my dad, and, well, where did they come from? And, well, and so we keep going back, and finally the mom says, well, people came from God. God created the man and the woman. She went to her father and asked the same question. And her father said, well, I know what your mom says, but, you know, we really came from a common ancestor that was kind of like an animal. And uh, we don't know exactly what that was. It's called the missing link, but that, that's where we came from. So the little girl went back and said, Mom, Dad said we had animal ancestors. And not wanting to absolutely contradict her husband, but not wanting to leave the, the confusion there. And she said, well, honey, I was talking about my ancestors. He was talking about his. You get it. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of giving you a message, and and, uh, I consider this a great privilege to share God's word with you today. And a few weeks ago, we talked about God's great story. God's great story begins with God, who had no beginning. God is self-existent. I don't get that, but he's always been there and he always will be. And he's always been there as Father, Son, and Spirit. And they lived in this dynamic love relationship, the Father for the Son, the Son for the Father, the Spirit for the Son, the Spirit for the Father, the Father for the Spirit. And there was this kind of a circular dance of each one living for each other. 
God, however, wanted a very large family. Just a little bit of review of what I gave you a few weeks back. The scripture tells us that God wanted this large, large family. And he wanted his own son to be the first among many. And that's what God wanted in the very beginning. And so we have the creation account, and we read through it, and we hear God saying, that's good, that's good, that's good. And then, of course, there was one thing that wasn't good, and that was that man was alone. And so God took charge of that. But the statement that I gave you a few weeks ago was this, and it's a quote from somebody I like to read, the fire in God's belly, the fire in God's belly was and is to be united with his creation. And therefore, you get that shout at the end of Revelation. Behold, God dwells with his creatures, with his creation. And the new heaven came down and made the new earth. And that's the bigger story. But to go back, God wanted this large family. And God wanted his son to be the very first of many, many sons and daughters. So I want to pick up right about there and ask the question, what does God want? And that statement is an overarching answer that God wanted to be with his creation. He wanted to be intimate with his creation. But I'd like to break that down just a little bit. I'd like to have us look at some different parts of that overarching desire of God. And these are all answered in the scripture that we read. So what did God do after creating all that he had as the quintessential creation? He created a man in his own image. So what does God want? He wanted a person. The plants, the animals were all beautiful, but they didn't satisfy God. And so God created a person. And as we read, we didn't read, but Psalm 8 tells us that God created man in his image a little lower than God, a little lesser version of himself. And we use the term imagers. Adam was an imager of God, created in God's own image. And I will not, I'll make reference to a number of, of scriptures today, but good one to follow up with is Psalm 8, and that gives us that picture of the order of creation, and man being at the very top of God's created being. There's something fascinating that you realize once you read scripture, you realize that God does what he does to enjoy what he has done. God does what he does to enjoy what he has done. God didn't create out of need. I love a poem by James Weldon Johnson, except for one word. It says that God said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a man. No, God was not lonely. God had everything that God needed in this wonderful relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. So he created out of the joy that it would bring him. So God created you and me in the same way. That he, well, not quite the same way. But he created us as he created Adam. He created us out of what he started in Adam. And you know, God has a plan for each individual. We read, we heard from Pastor Michael a couple of weeks ago how that Ephesians 10, 2.10 tells us that God created good works for everybody to do. He created the good works before he created me and you to do them. Now, we don't come to God because we do our good works. We do our good works because God has already come to us and we have received him. And many people who think that if we just work well enough, hard enough, good enough, that we're okay with God. No, Jesus Christ is the only one who brings us to God. 
And no matter how small, how weak, how short life, no matter, God has a purpose for everyone in someone's life. And most of us fulfill that in unspectacular ways, but for small things. I love the question, what good shall I do this day? And a little better version of that is, what good would God have me do this way, this day? So just as God wanted Adam, he wanted you. But he didn't stop there, did he? So God also wanted a family, and he created Eve. Now, many jokes have been made about the rib, you know, but that's the record. And it's reported that uh, Adam said, uh, whoa, man, when he said woman, when he saw Eve, whom God had created. He had named all the animals, and whatever he named them, that was what they're called. I'm not sure about this, but I think he was getting a little bit tired. And when he came to the dog, he said, dog, uh, God, oh, D-O-G. Maybe that's why he named the dog. Maybe the reversal of God. But whatever he named them, now he sees Eve and he said, she is woman. And from the man came the woman. And we see this wonderful cycle of woman taking her life from man and then giving it back again. And that's part of God's wonderful plan. So Adam and Eve were given dominion by God. He told them to multiply, and he told them to go out and to take charge of the whole earth. They were to make of all of the earth what the garden was. God created the garden. He set the pattern for them, and then he wanted them to go out. And this was a command. And so they were to do this together. So we have God wanting a person, and God wanting a family, and God wanting a family that he could partner with. Here's another fascinating statement. The limitless God the limitless God imposed limits upon himself so that he could share his sovereignty, his power. He could share with all the earth, all his created being. So God imposed limitations. And what I'm saying out of this, that God has ordained there are certain things for you and me to do, for us as individuals, for us as a church. And remember Jesus said, into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a command. That's what God has given us to do. And God has done his part, and he will continue to do his part. But it's up to you and to me to do the part, the parts that he has ordained. You know, some of Jesus' first words recorded were, follow me. And he gathered the disciples around him. So we have a man, we have a family, we have tasks. God has things for us to do. And the God of all creative power is the one who is behind that. Beyond that, God wants you to know who you are in him. He wants you to know how important you are. He wants you to know what tasks he has for you to do. And that's what this partnering is really all about. Why else would Jesus have come to this earth to live as a man, taking off, as it were, his godliness, not surrendering the fact that he was God, but laying aside all the privileges, all the joy, and becoming one of us, and dying, and rising, and ascending, and sending the Spirit and empowering us. We have a power that God has ordained and has given to us. So the sermon in a sentence is, what does God want? God wants a, you. He wants a family. He wants partners. He wants you to know who you are and why your life has value to him. Being a child of God 
is the most secure, profound identity that anyone could possibly have. You know, a lot of people grow up, and I wouldn't be surprised when we have this many people here, feeling unloved and unwanted. But you were never unloved. You were never unwanted, even though those who should have done that. God always loved you. God always wanted you. And God wants all people to be his children by choice. He doesn't force himself upon any, any of us. But it's his will that none would perish, no one. He wants everyone to be a part of his family. So this leaves no room for racism, racial superiority, for coercion, violence, for manipulation of people, or any such thing as that. Because God wants every one of us be siblings to each other. And I have found that when I look at people who make me angry or disappoint me, if I can look at them as pre-Christians, as pre-siblings of mine, it helps me to pray and it helps me to understand a little bit more of what God wants. God wants you. He wants a family. He wants a family he can partner with he wants you to know who you are and how important you are to him. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, you are an awesome God, and we thank you for your creative powers on our behalf. Give us a greater understanding of who you are and who we are in you day by day week by week, month by month. And remind us of those great works that you have for us to do. Whether they're small or large, they're great because you have ordained them. So we thank you and ask you to bless this message to our growth as individuals and as a church. In Jesus' name. We come to the point of communion. I'd like to read a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the Lord's instruction on communion. For I've received of the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Examine yourself. Only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment upon themselves. This is the Lord's Supper. He establishes the standards by which we come. But the invitation is to all. Jesus, as he first came, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I would call you to just a moment of repentance, asking the Lord to just put his finger on a negative attitude, a nasty word, or something that he did tell you to do, and you didn't. Take just a moment. Go before the Lord in a moment of silent confession.
Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. God's word says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we move into the time of communion. I have a quotation here I would like to share with you. The eternal purpose of the Father is to bring us into existence not just into existence, but into his house. And not just into his house, but to his table. And not just to his table, but to his right hand. And not just to his right hand, but into conversation with him. And not just into conversation with him, but into face-to-face -face fellowship with God the Father himself. John Wesley said that we meet Christ. We don't believe in any literal changing of the bread or the wine, but we believe that it has a wonderful symbolic presence. And there's a very real sense in which we are at the Lord's table and that we are fellowship with him. And in this church, we practice open communion. You do not need to be a member of this church. As the scripture said, I read a few minutes ago, you need to be a part of the family of God, and you are invited to partake in as much as you have examined yourself. The servers will come, we'll serve you, and then we will partake.
bread in the cup. This bread is without yeast. It represents the sinless body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he took it. And he broke it. And then this juice is without fermentation. It represents the pure blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, without which there is no remission of sin. And so, Lord God, we ask you to bless the bread, bless, bless the cup, the juice, to our spiritual growth, to consecrate it and ourselves. take the bread and take Lord Jesus, we thank you for going to the cross, surrendering your life for the sins of humankind, for the sins of individual people. We praise your name. We thank you. Amen. Let us sing the concluding song.
benediction, Romans 15, 13. And the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.